And uh, also, I published recently a uh, very interesting uh, uh, generalization or new localization landscape for Dirac fermions, which is of high interest because it's a Dirac equation is a non-scalar equation. Uh, so recently, we uh, we had only addressed a uh, uh, scalar equation. So I think it's uh, what is going to talk about uh, today. So, uh, Professor Gardo Benakir, this the floor is here to you. Very good. I hope you can all see me and see the screen. So it's my great pleasure to be here. Actually, being there physically would have been more fun, but well, we have to adapt to the times. Um, yes, I have a, a presentation which perhaps will interest you. I hope so or not. It's not very long. And so I would encourage you to ask questions during the talk. I, I realized the previous talk had no questions during the talk. I, I find this a little bit boring if there are no questions. So I don't have very much to say, so it will be over pretty quickly. And so if you ask me questions, uh, I think it will be more lively. So please, by all means, interrupt me, ask anything you want, and I'll be able, to, I'll try to answer any questions you might okay, have. This, is, this comment is valid uh, for the students also. No, absolutely, for, for everyone. I mean, this is, this is uh, please interrupt me, ask anything, and, and it will be much more lively, and, and uh, you'll see that it will be much more enjoyable. Okay, point eight. So, yes, uh, localization landscape, the rock fermions. Uh, I will go a bit slow. I mean, I guess you guys are, are heroes of localization landscape, so probably to introduce the topic may seem silly, but then, you know, I'll be, I'll be done really, really quickly. And so just to expand this a little bit, I will actually introduce some stuff. And, and uh, so yes, for me, actually, this didn't start with the, with the journal club. It started with Math Overflow. Who of you knows about Math Overflow? Is anyone of you active on Math Overflow? Svetlana is active there. Anyone else? Okay, I'm, I'm not active. active. I'm using I'm... it in a passive way. You know, I, I go and ask questions and don't answer you. I, must I am addicted I'm old who to do. Math Overflow. I'm completely addicted to Math Overflow. I, I probably would spend hours every single day there, like, like a teenager on Facebook. And I get good ideas from Math Overflow. That's why I like it. I get, you know, interesting ideas. And I would never have known about the landscape if it were not for Victor Galitsky, who actually is a colleague of mine from Maryland who noticed this paper, which two of you published not so long ago about computing spectra without solving eigenvalue problems. And he went to Math Overflow saying, this is completely crazy. I've never heard of this. What on earth does it mean? And this intrigued me. And, and um, I started looking into this. I wrote this comment, a commentary uh, telling what I understood and somehow then try to do something myself. So this is basically how it all started. Not so long ago, the end of last year. And, and I know you guys are the experts on localization. I, I'm not gonna compete with that. There's nothing I can contribute to anything which you, you guys know so well. So I thought instead of trying to, to you know, play this game from that perspective, let me you know, go in a completely different direction and do some of the stuff which I actually do for a living which is topological insulators, the rock fermions, graphene, all this recent, these recent developments of massless electrons. So that was basically my idea. Perhaps this will work for massless electrons. Now comes the introduction. And, and uh, yes, uh, Svetlana and, and Marcel can now sit back and enjoy this or, or go and have a cup of coffee. But this is the idea. So the idea is, is something which I found really creative and, and, and intriguing. Uh, given some random potential, you see a random potential there in the, in, the, in the lower left corner. Given some random potential, can we predict where the waves will localize? Now, uh, Anderson localization is, is, a, is, a, is something different from the usual trapping in potential wells. If I give you some landscape and I see some potential well, and you see a very deep potential well, you probably figure out that the particles will get trapped in that potential well. But Anderson would not have won the Nobel Prize if all he had done was show that deep potential wells can trap particles. Instead, he showed that, you know, just random white noise potentials without any obvious 
deep wells can still trap particles because of quantum interference. So there'll be interference and, and waves will interfere constructively or destructively and, and peaks will emerge and you see peaks here in, in, the, in the right corner. Peaks will emerge uh, out of this and, and uh, it's not obvious how, how these peaks would have anything to do with the random landscape. And so that was the, the, the achievement in this paper, a method to somehow convert this random potential into something which shows where the wave function will peak. And it worked pretty nicely. This is from, from this paper. You see the, 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 this landscape function, which is a nonlinear way of smoothing the potential, gives you contour lines. And these contour lines are, are the, basically the potential wells where the particle will localize. So how does this work? Well, um, this, this thing, which is called the landscape function, it's, it's, a, it's a scalar function of position, which provides um, an upper bound on the eigenstate amplitude. And the upper bound has a particular form. Here, here, is, here you can see how it looks like. So you take the, this eigenstate psi at energy E, and you normalize it you normalize it by maximum. So psi of r absolute value is normalized by the maximum. So the left-hand side of this inequality is at most one. And on the right-hand side of the equality, it says the same e multiplied by the landscape function. And um, obviously, if the energy is small, if the energy goes to zero, the left-hand side could be as large as one if you're near a peak. And so if the, right, the left-hand side is one and e goes to zero, it means that you should have a peak. And of course, it could be a useless inequality. You, you, you could be a million everywhere, and then the inequality would be true, but it wouldn't be very helpful. But it turns out that in, in, in many interesting cases, U actually is typically kind of small and only peaks when it should peak. And that is the, the, the idea. And uh, what is this U? So here, here is the, 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 the result, which already is, is not quite a decade old that if you have a Hamiltonian, which is the usual Hamiltonian for Anderson localization, which is minus Laplacian plus some random potential, the random potential should be positive. Then this, this landscape function is determined by solving a particular differential equation with one on the right-hand side. And then on the left-hand side, it's just the same Hamiltonian. So this is just one, one equation. We're not solving for a spectrum. It's not an eigenvalue equation or anything. It's just one equation, which gives you U and that U should do the trick. That is a neat idea, which as many neat ideas is not entirely without a prehistory. There is a prehistory, which is in, in elasticity theory where, where they don't have a potential. There's no random potential in elasticity theory, but there are random shapes or, or complicated shapes, some object, which has some complicated shape. And you want to solve for Laplacian you want to, there's some, some boundary condition, say the Eclat boundary condition, and you want to solve for, for, for the Laplacian is of some function is zero inside and satisfies the Eclat boundary conditions. And then there is this, this idea, which, which it's, it's an old idea, that, that the, 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 these eigenmodes are very well described by a function u, which solves Laplacian of u is minus one and the same Dirichlet boundary condition. And uh, you could say in a sense that what, what, what Mybern and Filosh have done is taken this old idea, first of all, added a random potential, and then took it, taken it from the somehow classical topic of, of elasticity theory to a more modern, or at least you know, for physicists, much more interesting problem of, of Anderson localization. This, this, this uh, review by Steinerberger, which I'm sure many of you uh, know, I found it very, very insightful and I would recommend it if you don't know about it. Okay, we're not doing too well on questions. Perhaps I should offer a prize or something, but, but we're not there yet. Perhaps a question will come. Okay, here is just a very simple proof. Uh, just just, uh, to, yes, uh, just to interrupt you, yeah. Uh, I think that the, yeah, if I'm not mistaken, the torsion function in the, uh, in this, uh, the elasticity problem, comes from the problem of uh, when you have a cylinder of a constant cross section and you uh, make a torsion between the basis and the top, the, uh, then what happens is that you have a deformation of the, of the, of the cross section at both ends. And the deformation at the, the cross section at both ends, they obey this uh, 
type of uh, equation. That's why it's called the torsion function. It's something that pops up when you, you, you twist a cylinder, they, yeah. it pops up at the end, you know. So. Yeah, this is absolutely so it's correct. Not, it's, not, it's not really coming from a, a question of localization. It's a... Uh, no, it's I didn't. No, no, it's, it's, it's unrelated to localization. Okay, it's, it's, yeah. it's unrelated to localization. It's the solution of this problem. Please tell me, I have some complicated shape here. Here's the shape. Please tell me how the, the eigenmode of this resonator, some resonator, it's a 2D resonator. I mean, for the torsion, you would elongate it in three dimensions, but for the, for the, 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 the eigenmode will be a 2D shape. I have this 2D shape, please give me the eigenmode. And uh, this eigenmode has this particular profile. And, and uh, actually you can see, I think the two, the, two, the two figures you see here, one is the real eigenmode and the other is this torsion function. And it agrees pretty well. Yeah, agreed. By the way, I have a question, which, which I'm sure one of you can answer. Do you see my cursor? Or am I the only one who sees the cursor? No, yes, no, we, we see it. We see it. You see, you see the cursor. Okay, I yes. wasn't sure about that. Good. Okay, so I can use the cursor. So I think this is U of R, and this is the real eigenmode, and, and they agree pretty well. Very good. We had a question. That's always the first one to ask. Okay, here's a simple proof, which is from, from, from my Berlin Philosophy's paper. Uh, it all rests on, on pointwise inequalities. So I, I, I'm very familiar with the notion of a positive definite operator and, and or positive definite matrix. And, and typically if I give you a matrix and I tell you it's positive, you're referring to the eigenvalues. But eigenvalues don't play a role here. Here we'll be saying when we say that the matrix is positive, we mean that every single matrix element is positive. And so here if you have an operator, we say that this up, when we say that the operator is positive, we mean that it's positive for every single element. So here's how the, how the argument goes. You start with the, with the absolute value of psi, and then you do something which seems kind of silly. You first multiply psi, it's an eigenfunction. You first multiply by the, uh, multiply by the, okay, that's here. You multiply by the eigenvalue, and then you multiply by the inverse of the operator, if it's an eigenstate, you know, first multiplying by the eigenvalue and then multiplying by the inverse of the operator should give you the same thing. And then you use the, the, the Cauchy inequality, so the absolute value of an operator acting on a function. There are lots of cancellations there, so certainly it becomes bigger if you take the absolute values inside. If you take an absolute value here and an absolute value of psi. Now psi obviously is, that's not rocket science, is smaller than its maximum, so I, I maximize it even further. And then I have this thing here, which doesn't look too helpful. It's the absolute value of the inverse of an operator acting on just a unit, like a vector with all elements equal to one. And now comes the key thing. So all of this is trivial. The first three inequalities are trivial. And the fourth inequality is well known, but I didn't, I'd never realized this, that actually the inverse of the Laplacian operator is point rise positive. So minus Laplacian plus V is certainly not positive. Even if V is positive, the Laplacian gives you negative off diagonal elements. But once you invert it, you only get positive stuff. So these absolute values here are superfluous and you're done. So this inverse of the Laplacian plus V is pointwise positive if the potential is positive, if it's is itself positive. And so we have this relation that Psi is smaller than E times Psi max times U where you, yes, it's the inverse acting on one, which just means that U solves Laplacian plus V equals one. So this is really crazy, you know. I've been working, I've been working in Laplacian plus V throughout my career. It never occurred to me that the inverse would be point-wise positive. And I asked around to some of my colleagues, and many of them did not know that at well. I even tried it on a computer, you know, tight binding, taking the Laplacian, making a tight binding thing, inverting it, and then lo and behold, this matrix has only positive elements. So um, it's very I, well I known. Have, I have to mention that, that I'm not sure that, that would be helpful, but I think as a lot of this business, we have been starting from ideas coming from vibrations and things like this and ended up in Schrodinger. And uh, that's why for us, it wasn't that shocking in the sense that it's just the maximum principle. Yeah. You know, I, I, this, I, this positivity is equivalent to the fact that applying a positive load or applying a positive source, you have a positive outcome. Yeah, I, I realized that. In fact, the first thing I did, of course, was type in Google positive Green's function, and I got a whole bunch of hits. So it was not 
unknown, but I can guarantee you, go to people from my community, tell them the inverse of Laplacian plus V is positive, and they'll look at you and say, you mean positive definite? No, not positive definite, positive pointwise. Nobody knows these stuff. But do they Good. know the maximum principle? I mean, yeah, I knew the maximum principle, but somehow... By the maximum principle, and that would be cut, summarize your proof. Yep, absolutely. So, well, but okay, what we, so, <clears throat> but no, I guess I guess I want to just interrupt one 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 more comment. Um, you know, we we're really fascinated to hear what you're going to say next, because it's exactly in the context of scalar functions that we have these kinds of tools of the maximum principle and and non-negativity that that we're familiar with, but um, in the case of um, you know, matrices and vectors and Dirac operators, we're quite puzzled. So, yeah, so we'll, you know, we'll in other there. words, yeah, exactly. So this is very interesting if we'll get there. Have something like we'll that. We'll get there. But since everything I have to say is so simple, I thought I should, you know, give you some intro at least, do not to somehow, but, but we'll, we'll get there. In fact, we'll get there right now. Okay, so this was the, the, the demonstration. You, you, you know, eigenstates, even there's even a, a, an enhancement of this stuff. Not only do the, the wave functions peak at the locations of the eigenstate, but somehow the highest peak, the highest peak is the lowest level. I mean, we have this inequality, each bigger than one over u max, but it could be a useless inequality, but actually it's not. This bigger is more like bigger approximately equal to. So if you order the peaks from high to high to higher or less high and less high, you see the first lowest level, next lowest level, next lowest level, next lowest level. So this works really amazing. And now comes, yes, so I was amazed by all of this. I learned something, but I'm in the business of writing papers. So when I read something and I learn something, I want to apply it to something new. And I've been in this business of graphene for, for more than a decade. And graphene is a bit of a different localization problem. It's, it's, uh, it's a matrix, matrix value problem. The potential is here. There are two types of potentials. You can have the same potential on the, di on the two diagonals, or you can have off diagonal. This is the mu is called the staggered potential, and the V is called just scalar potential. And then the momentum is linear, and it appears on the off diagonal, Px minus Ipy and Px plus Ipy. <clears throat> Sorry, is mu a number or a function? No, no, V and U are random functions of position. Well, they could be random or they could not be random. They could be anything, but it's, it's just some function of position. Typically, in, 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 in the physics context, this describes a sheet of carbon, a monolayer sheet of carbon. And then V is a scalar potential, so just some electric field, so electric, electrostatic potential, which, which could be like impurities. And mu describes the effect of a substrate. The substrate has a different effect than just, than just random impurities, and, and it gives you this staggered potential mu. Oh yeah, this is a topic, you know, it's, it's 100,000 uh, papers on this one topic, and, and, uh, but I, it's something I like, and, I, and many people enjoy working on graphene. Localization is very peculiar in graphene, very different from the usual Anderson localization. It, it's a fun topic, and, and, and uh, I think, well, why not write down the landscape function for the Dirac equation? This is what it's called. It's called the Dirac equation because first it came from relative, it's linear in momentum. So the dispersion relation is the dispersion relation of massless particles. It's a relativistic dispersion relation. Not that these electrons are really massless, but somehow the effective mass is zero and, and that. Good. So that's, that's the thing. How do we do that? Well, there's no obvious analog because uh, Certainly the inverse of this Dirac Hamiltonian, this Dirac operator is definitely not pointwise positive. It's not even, you could say perhaps I square it. If I square it, it will be, at least the eigenvalues will be positive if I square it. I mean, it's a Hermitian operator. If I square it, all the eigenvalues will be positive. So it's definitely a positive operator, but it's not pointwise positive. And so none of the, I don't know, the, 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 this doesn't seem like a very fruitful way to proceed. So, and I struggled with this for perhaps a month, trying all kinds of clever tricks and none of the clever tricks worked, hoping to find, find the answer on Google as I usually do. And yes, the answer was there, it was on Google. It's actually very, very well known in a completely different community from, from physics, from physicists. 
In fact, I claim that this is the first application of this technique to a conventional physics problem. And it's this technique which is known as the comparison matrix. It's, it's, back, it's 1930s work, Ostrovsky is the hero, comparison matrix. And it's not an unknown thing. If you Google, if it has its own Wikipedia entry, you can Google it at this moment. Uh, comparison matrix, it's not a very long entry, it's a small entry, but it's there, it's there on Wikipedia, so it's not something which is unknown. And there are books, this is actually one of the books, this is the book which got me started, because I just Googled non-negative or positive. And if you enter non-negative on Google, you get many hits. So it took me like a month to go through all the hits, but then I found this book, and this has the answer. This has the magic answer. So first, what is the comparison matrix? It's a totally general thing. You give me any complex matrix, doesn't have to be Hermitian or anything, just some complex matrix. And for the comparison matrix, I do two things. I take absolute value of all the matrix elements. And then on the diagonal, I take minus the absolute value. Excuse me, on the off diagonal. On the off diagonal, I take minus the absolute value. And on the diagonal, I take the absolute value. That's it. And this is pretty much the entire entry on Wikipedia. There's not much more to say, and, and uh, that's, that's the thing. So every matrix has its own com comparison matrix. I need a notation for comparison matrix. Um, mathematicians use angular brackets, H between angular brackets. If you're a physicist, that's an absolutely non-starter because we use angular brackets for expectation value. So if I give you the Hamiltonian and I tell you, I put the Hamiltonian between angular brackets, everybody will think I'm taking the expectation value. So that doesn't work. So I invented my own notation and, and uh, it's this over brackets, perhaps it will stick. I have a simple LaTeX code. It's not a standard LaTeX command, but if you, if you download my paper from the archive, our paper from the archive, you'll find a nice over brackets. So that is the thing. And now comes the magic trick, and that's all I need, and that's what I learned from Ostrovsky, that if you, that if you take the inverse of, of the matrix H, and you take, so all the, everything here is pointwise, so the absolute value is pointwise, and the inequality side is pointwise. You take the inverse of a matrix H, take the absolute value of all the matrix elements, then these are pointwise less than the inverse of the comparison matrix if the comparison matrix itself is positive definite. So that's absolutely a non-trivial requirement. We need that. We need a positive definite comparison matrix, but if it's positive definite, in fact, you can relax this even a bit, you can make this even a bit more relaxed. The comparison matrix doesn't need to be Hermitian. It doesn't need to be Hermitian. So if it's not Hermitian, then at least the, the real part of the eigenvalues should be positive. If the real part of the eigenvalues is positive, that's what I would call generalized positive definite. Then we have this inequality. And of course, once we have this inequality, we're done because then we just go back to the, to the mybrella filosh uh, derivation where at some moment we have to bound this thing here and we just bound it by the comparison matrix. So this is the magic thing and it all works like a charm. So this is the new landscape function. The landscape function is not H of u is one, but this comparison matrix times u is one. And we have the same, the, the, the inequality is the same, that, that doesn't change, the same landscape inequality. And we just have to make sure that the, yes, we have to make sure that this comparison matrix is positive definite. And this is basically the same problem which we have with the original comparison matrix. You need some potential which is sufficiently large to lift the stuff up to make sure that, 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 yes, that you have a positive definite thing. So that, that's the same limitation. And now some tests. So first the 1D test, because the 1D test is something I can check trivially with Mathematica. 1D Dirac Hamiltonian. So uh, Dirac Hamiltonian, I have it actually. Where was my Dirac Hamiltonian? I had, yeah, here's the Dirac Hamiltonian. So H is, so I take one dimensional, so just PX sigma X plus mu sigma Z plus V sigma zero. Sigma is, is Pauli matrix, of course. It's, it's one dimensional, but it's still a two by two matrix. So this is, I have two plots here. Both is 1D Dirac Hamiltonian. One is near the band bottom and, and the other is near a gap. Because the Dirac Hamiltonian um, 
can have a gap. So it can have a spectrum, it, it will have a bounded spectrum, but the, the bounded spectrum can have a gap near zero. So that there's a, so you can either be near the band bottom, that's, that's here at the left, or you can be near the, near the band edge of the, near the edge of the band gap, that's here at the right. And in both, both cases, it works actually nicely. Um, yes, you see, you see the, 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 the red thing is the comparison matrix, and the blue thing are the lowest eigenfunctions. Here, here are the here you can see the, 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 eigen, the eigenvalues, and you even can see that the same tracking which we're familiar with occurs. So, at the biggest peak is the lowest energy, and then the next I don't know the next biggest peak is so probably this guy here. That's E two, then I have E three, then I have E four, E five, E six, and so this tracking of peaks with with uh, sorry, sorry uh, Carlo, can I can I yes, interrupt? I'm not, I'm not understanding. Um, you you had your your one D Dirac Hamiltonian still was matrix valued, absolutely. And these U's are okay. No, no, hang on. So, so okay. S good question. Let me let me let me. Not only is it matrix value, but it's an operator. It's it's yeah. it's in it's in 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 real space. P is so. The first thing I do is so all of this works for matrices. So. The first thing I do, I have to put everything in the form of a matrix. And so there will be two ways in which this will become a matrix. One is become, it will become a tight binding model. So I have to discretize momentum. I, I take a square grid, a triangular grid or a square grid. I have to discretize momentum. And, so and when, you said, when you said 1D, you were referring to the line, the, that is the discretization yeah, so is just one dimensional. Line, but it will still be a matrix in this other, in this other spinner coordinate, absolutely. Yes. Which is fine. I mean, matrix is matrix, and 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 uh, I think in this particular, in fact, in this plot, in this plot, I did the following. Yeah, that's I think so, what I did. In this plot, uh, every coordinate has actually two peaks. I mean, they're pretty much the two spinner components are almost the same, but every coordinate has two peaks. I just plotted one next to the other. I could have when, taken the... When, when the, you write the, the top I'm inequality... Not, David, I'm not understanding how matrix has become a vector. You just uh, stretched yes. it out, meaning that you just yes. have... Yes. Sort of. so, so, okay. So, the... the you, you, In, oh. the, in, the equa in the No, hang on. In the equation, I have this index M in the equation takes on ranges over two degrees of freedom. One is a spatial index. Could be one D or two D, and the other is a spinner index, so it's one two. Uh -huh. That's uh -huh. in so you, you just stretch them out into one. Absolutely. I see. It's one long so string. Actually, long if you string. look at, if you would look very carefully here, even though it says coordinate X goes to two hundred, there are actually four hundred data points because I just put the, the the even and the odd spinner components next to each other. I could have taken, could have summed them and squared them or whatever. It doesn't really make a difference, actually. Got it. So you but, you just taking them like one by one, real absolutely. imaginary, real imaginary, but, real imaginary. But 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 in the top line on on this very slide, yes, you have an inequality and you have a un on the on the right hand side. Yes. Yes. And so in order for me to interpret this, I need to do it component by component by yes. component. So n will lay n, n will run both of so when I say absolute value of psi of n, I don't mean the absolute value of the spinner. Definitely not. This so the index n will run over the space and it will run over spinner degrees of freedom. Everything is pointwise. Mm -hmm. So so this says the okay. the and it says for example the first component of the spinner on one particular position is bounded by the first component of the landscape function. Very good. Okay. Everything that's, is pointwise. Now, there's not much interesting here in the spinner components don't do much stuff, actually. So you might as well just forget about this and, and replace this by spinner norm or whatever. Okay, this is, this is Dirac. Now 2D. 2D, I could have done 2D Dirac, but I did something just to, to, to be a, you know, to change gears a bit. I took something which, okay, this is again one of those things which in condensed matter theory is very, Topical these days, it's called a chiral PUF superconductor. It's also 2D. The Hamiltonian is here. It looks kind of similar. You see PX sigma X plus PY sigma Y, but now this is multiplied by delta because this is actually the pair potential. This is a superconductor. And the P squared, the familiar P squared is, is separately. So this is, a, this is a, a, a problem where you have a, this should be a sigma Z. I made a mistake here. Sigma X should be a sigma Z, apologies. So this is a problem 
where, where I have a pair potential, which depends on momentum. That's why it's called chiral P wave. And then I have a scalar potential V and I have a P squared over two M sigma Z. And in this case, the sigma Z counts electrons and holes. This is all just, it's physics uh, stuff. If Carlo, you Google chiral P wave superconductor, you'll Carlo. find thousands of papers. Yes, please. Uh, I think you should, uh, for mathematician at least, the, del the meaning of the delta here. No, it's just a, it's, it's just a, delta here is, is like V, it's just a function of X and Y. Yes, no, it's, it might be meaning <laughs> for mathematician, you know. Physics is delta. <laughs> so that's why I mentioned it. No, no, delta is not, it's just a, it's just some function of X and Y, which I could also have called uh, V tilde. It's some, some disordered thing, which for yeah, physicists, well, they, they say- For, for, for physicists of the solid state, of solid state physics, they know what it is in superconducting, Absolutely. but so, uh, delta is very confusing for mathematicians. Yes. You know? Okay, so this delta, no, good, excellent point. This delta is just some random scalar function of X and Y. And V is also a random scalar function of X and Y. And um, it's just some other model and-, and uh, oh, So and, it's and, a closed order operator. Yeah, absolutely. P, no, no, actually, in this no, case, there's a P squared. There's a P squared term. There's a P squared term here as well. Ah. P squared is the abbreviation for BX squared plus PY ah. squared. Okay. P squared. So if I wouldn't have the delta term, this would be just two copies of the Schrodinger. Two copies okay, of so the so usual. The delta term squared. is the first order. Yes. P squared plus V is like Schrodinger, and your delta term is like drift. Yes. So the delta term couples. So this, this is a sigma Z. Sigma Z means one. V squared plus P squared in the upper left corner of the matrix and minus V minus P squared in the lower right corner of the matrix. And then there are off diagonal elements which couple this matrix and that's superconductivity. It's, it's some bizarre stuff. There's lots of, this has actually, I mean, if, if you probably have heard the word Majorana Fermion, if, uh, if you haven't lived under a stone. So this is the model for Majorana Fermions. This was actually my interest in this business was to do Majorana Fermions. So this is the, 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 the system which has Majorana fermions, topological, quantum computing, Microsoft, the whole thing. Anyway, this is, this is a heroic Hamiltonian and it works like a charm. I mean, I don't have to do anything. I just have to put it on this lattice, calculate the, the, the comparison matrix. And, and so here the plot is that the, um, the, peaks, the peaks are it's some sort of a hybrid plot. The peaks are the, the, the eigenstates and the, the color scale plot is U of X and Y, it's this landscape function. And, and, uh, and then the colors continue in the peaks. So you see the peaks are red and the peaks are red, which means that the landscape function has a peak there. Somehow, you guys know this, it's kind of difficult to plot, plot all of this nicely in two dimensions, but it, it looks kind of convincing, it works well. So that's what I had to say about 2D. And then I have one more thing, which is a bit of an outlook. I could tell you more about outlooks, but this will be more like outlooks for a physicist, so perhaps not so exciting for you. This is one outlook. So in, in my business, we have this thing which we call universality classes. So universality classes are Hamiltonians which share the same type of universal properties. For example, the same critical exponents for Anderson localization. We know Anderson localization is kind of robust, you can have very many different Hamiltonians and, and the critical exponents are the same. And then you add a magnetic field and then the critical exponents change. And so we say that the universality class for the quantum Hall effect is, even though the quantum Hall effect has Anderson localization, it's in a different universality class as the conventional zero field Anderson localization. Well, I would like to introduce here something which is called equivalence class. So universality class always talks about universal properties in a random sense. You have to get, consider an ensemble of Hamiltonians with some disorder average. Here I would like to introduce equivalence classes which work in a particular Hamiltonian for one disorder realization. And these are just equimodular Hamiltonians. So Hamiltonians where the, where the matrix elements are the same in absolute value. So if you give me two Hamiltonians which have the same matrix elements in absolute value, it means they have the same comparison matrix. And if they have the same comparison matrix, I will predict that they localize at the same positions. So that's the, the prediction, so to say. And, and um, here's a test. And this is a paper which, which somehow mercifully appeared just as we were wrapping up our own paper. The paper of Anderson transition in, in, in non-Hermitian disorder. 
applications here could be, for example, to random lasers. These would be random systems, which would have randomness in both the real and the imaginary part of the dielectric constant. V would now be the dielectric constant. So you would have a complex, a complex potential, absorption amplification, that's, that's what these words would mean. And, you, and, and still Anderson localization exists and there's trapping and there, there are wave functions which peak at certain position. That's what Boris Klofsky, um, who's a colleague of one of you, uh, studied. And, and uh, I thought, okay, this is really cool. So let's do the comparison matrix for this thing. Now, now, now comes a little thing, which I guess you all know, if, if you've ever worked with type binding models, you know, you might think the comparison matrix is just taking the absolute value of V1 plus IV2, but that's not completely true, because if you put it on a lattice, the discretization also gives you diagonal terms, right? The, the discretization gives you diagonal terms. So you first have to add these diagonal terms to the complex potential and then subtract them. So you have to take the absolute, this is the diagonal term, it's the bandwidth. It's, it's the bandwidth on the square lattice. So there's the bandwidth plus the random potential, that's absolute value, and then you subtract the bandwidth. So it's slightly non-trivial, but it's kind of automatic. I mean, it's non-trivial, but it's not something I have to add. The recipe is the same. Put it on a lattice, because I can only work with stuff on a lattice. Take the matrix, take the Ostrovsky comparison matrix, and that's it, and then hope that it works. Pray what that do works. you mean by the bandwidth? Do you mean the lattice spacing? Yes. So the, the bandwidth is, uh, is, uh, is, is, is one of lattice spacing, yes. Oh, okay. We use it's the a, term it's like you have a cosine, it's a square lattice. You have a cosine band, and, and you, you know this stuff, right? If you discretize the Laplacian, you get off diagonal elements, but you also get a diagonal element. And this diagonal element, you have to add it to your, to your potential. Just different terminology, no problem. Excuse me? Just yeah, different bandwidth. terminology, no problem. Okay, it's, it's a cosine, the cosine band of a, of a tight binding model on square lattice. So it somehow works. So here you see the, the mm -hmm. now of course it's now not as obvious how to relate. We, previously when we did landscape function, we could also say highest peak is lowest energy level, next highest peak is next lowest level, energy level. That doesn't quite work as nicely. I mean, the, the, the eigenvalues of this matrix H are complex, or so in the complex plane, and, and this effective matrix, so the one with the, the effective one is the, is, the, is the one where I take the absolute value of the potential. This has real eigenvalues, so here's one, two, three, four, five, and then there are these things here which scatter a bit. I somehow hope that they would have this, the same absolute value or whatever, but that, that correspondence is not so nicely. But the correspondence of the wave functions is really nicely. So here you see one, two, three, four, five. These are the, the lowest, or at least, at least these prominent eigenstates of the complex Hamiltonian. And here are one, two, three, four, five, the, uh, the, uh, the eigenstates of H effective. And they're the same because they have the same comparison matrix. So this works. And actually, if you, if you look in the literature on um, um, hermit, the topic of hermitization, which is you study a non-Hermitian Hamiltonian, and you do this by converting it into a Hermitian matrix, that topic exists, but it's a very different prescription. It's, it's you double degrees of freedom, and you put something on the off diagonal. So this is a different way to hermitize something, which, which actually seems to work and, and may be worth studying in some further detail. So you guys, see guys, it worked. You guys asked me questions. And so I was able to extend the talk a little bit and still we're well before closing time. So I think it all worked. And, and perhaps if there are more questions, I will be happy to answer that and otherwise. Okay, and you wear strong applause. Can I not exactly have a question, but make uh, a, a remark which is not really in physics, but uh, you mentioned at one point, uh, you say this is not rocket physics, okay? And I just wanted to share with you the fact that now in France, when a journalist wants to uh, spread the same idea, he or she will say, this is not quantum physics. So Nepal de la physique quantique, which means that now quantum physics is really the standard 
of yep. very difficult stuff. Even Thomas Piketty, you know, the new Karl Marx, okay, of the 21st century. Uh, Thomas Piketty uh, recently on the radio say, oh, economy is not quantum physics. And so uh, just, of course, it's relevant to your talk, except that you used the, the, yep. the Schlenzer. But I want to thank you for, for your talk, because, of course, I'm not a theorist, but at least I grasp some of it. Thank you. <laughs> so for me, it was quantum physics. It is. <laughs> yes. So, uh, so, the, so the talk is open to questions. Uh, Hi. Oh. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yes, I actually do have uh, two questions. So the first question is, you need this comparison matrix to be positive or po positive definite to do your comparison. Okay. So this must impose some kind of condition on the potential. So what kind of potential can you use for this to work? So that's my first question. Okay, so the, there is a simple sufficient condition it's not a necessary condition but a simple sufficient condition is what's called diagonally dominant so the diagonal elements should be larger than the if you take a diagonal element it should be larger than the sum of everything else on that particular row okay so that's the that's effect operationally that's what we do we just if, make if sure that the diagonals a, are larger than what's on the sum if you had a multiple of identity to your operator then you lift everything and yes uh, now of course you're going to get so as you very well know all of this, and this, is a, this is the common limitation. L let me amplify a little bit on your question. This is the common limitation of the landscape approach. It works near band bottom. It does not work near band center. And you may have seen a recent paper by actually my former student, Jens Barnerson. You may have seen it on, on, on the archive. Uh, no, uh, when was that? It was uh, last week, Bardarson, B-A-R-D-A-R-S-O-N. It's another no. landscape function. How could you have missed it? Uh, it's with okay. the square functions. Marcel, we have seen that we have discussed it. It's the one oh, okay. with square okay. functions and the square. Okay. So basically, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. They are lifting. They are, they are going into the, the, the imaginary. So basically, the, the thing, the thing is this: if okay. you if you want to go to band center, and there are many reasons for wanting to go to band center, many reasons. If you want to go to band center, I do not know how to use any landscape approach. Period. And so what Barterson et al. do is they basically say, let's, instead of working with the landscape function, let's work with diagonal elements of the Green's function, which is the density of states, or local density of states, which of mm -hmm. course works brilliantly. That's why, I mean, local density of states is the best thing. It's the dream of mankind, right? So now they claim that actually calculating diagonal elements of Green's function is as efficient as solving this differential equation for the landscape function. I don't know. I could argue about that. But of course, if you have an efficient way to get the diagonal elements of the Green's function, then by all means, use the local density of states and this will work always. So I, I, it's, uh, this is an open problem and it's something we struggled with. And, and my students, some of the students are actually listening in at this moment. We struggled to no end to modify all of this so that it would work at band center. I do not know how to get this to work at band center. Uh, I think it's a real challenge, I agree. I have another question. So uh, first of all, thank you so much for your talk. It was fascinating. It was really a sharp pleasure for a mathematician of all people. Um, I have a question. So uh, as I'm sure you are aware of, there were follow-ups of this work, uh, which proved the actual exponential decay. Um, you know, can you say anything in that direction? Do you even observe it? numerically have you looked at the same so no. so um, yes so so my student Michal Pachowski was listening in at this moment hi Michal this was there he is this is one of the things he tried can we use these Ahman inequalities to somehow use this landscape this comparison matrix in a much more sophisticated way instead of just finding the eigenstates finding the exponential decay. Michal, I'm correct in saying that it never worked, right? So numerically it works in the sense, so there is this additional uh, interpretation of the landscape function that the inverse of the landscape function works as a confining potential. And the inverse of the landscape function uh, derived from the comparison matrix also works, seems to work like this numerically. Uh, 
but we haven't managed to prove it rigorously despite mm -hmm. them. So, so, you know, this will be a great topic if one of you is interested, you know, do Achman inequalities for the Rock equation, comparison matrix. I, I must say, what we've been able to do is very much limited to your initial thing, it peaks where it should peak. And, and all the rest it seems to agree. The biggest peak seems to be the lowest eigenvalues, but we've not been able to carry this further in, 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 in the same level you've been able to do. Got it. And uh, another question, which is actually coming from uh, my student who is here on, uh, on the call, but I'm afraid he might shy out instead of asking. Uh, Bruno uh, Poggi, uh, is, uh, can, can the same be applied to magnetic Schrodinger? Ah, okay, okay. Of course. Of course. <laughs> so here comes, here comes another in an interesting way. Here comes another ugly secret. So a vector potential is an equimodular transformation. It just adds phases to hopping matrix elements. So two Hamiltonians with a vector potential or no vector potential are equimodular. They have the same absolute value of the hopping matrix elements, same comparison matrix. So that's it, it fails. There's nothing you can say. Of course, you, you can do the comparison, it all works. But your conclusion is that Anderson localization in the magnetic field is the same as without a magnetic field. So no, this is again, one of these- yeah, This is, a, is this consistent with the fact that uh, in fact, uh, you don't have to do any hermitization that is already omission with the magnetic field. So uh, there is no- uh, No, but you would somehow. hope. Look, Anderson localization in the magnetic field is a different universality class. Yes. And so you would hope that the, that the landscape function would know whether you've applied a magnetic field or not. And the answer is it does not. So I, if at least, at least not, I don't know how to do this. So if I, I, if I calculate the comparison matrix for a Hamilton, which is P plus EA squared, P plus vector potential squared, then this is just a, a, a phase factor to hopping matrix elements. So the comparison matrix is the same, it drops out. So again, a miserable limitation. I have no idea how to work around that. Any other question? So uh, I, I do have a just quick comment on the previous one about this magnetic field. So, so instead of solving H U is equal to one, what if you just applied the A, you know, uh, magnetic transformation like to one instead of one you have e raised to the whatever you're transformed by would that be anything useful this sounds like a brilliant idea i have no idea no I, you know I, I i tried so many things i was happy that finally something worked if you tell me i have something else which might work i would congratulate you i mean by all means look into this you know the whole i mean the way i see the this word landscape function is open to interpretation, right? We can have our own method, our own technique. And, and uh, I found something which worked and many other things which I tried did not work. I can give you a, a longer list of things which we tried which did not work. And th these are some of the open problems. How to do quantum Hall effect localization, how to do localization near band center if, if I don't just go the cheap way, which is dense, local density of states. Majorana zero modes, don't get me started on Majorana zero modes. There's, there's so many open problems here and, and I, you know, I did what, I, what worked and there's lots of stuff which I don't know how to get it worked, but if you can get it worked, by all means, it, it, this will be really, really, many people will be really interested in that. Thanks, and thanks for the talk too, it's great. Good. So, no more questions from the, the physics side? Uh, I, th I find the physicist uh, uh, rather silent. No, Claude, nothing? Uh, I, I'm not a physicist, but maybe I'll okay. try to say, okay. ask one more question. Um, this is David Jarrison, hi. Um, hi David. I, uh, just, this is just a follow-up on what uh, Li Chen uh, asked about with the uh, positivity. Do, do you, is, as a practical matter, you said that if the diagonal dominates, then of course you're guaranteed uh, uh, as a theoretical matter that uh, you get the positive definiteness that you need for your, for your matrix to, 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 uh, to, to work. But um, as a practical matter, 
you can just take a add a multiple of the identity, raise it up a little bit, and just wait until the thing goes positive definite. You don't you don't have to you don't have to Absolutely. wait until the, you have this domination. So I'm 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 curious as a practical matter um, whether that's quite a bit lower. That is whether no, whether it that's it doesn't it doesn't lower. So basically, what if you if you if you try to force it to be positive definite, you get a landscape function which is a valid inequality. Mm -hmm. but it will be useless, it will be featureless. I, I'm, I'm sure any one of you knows this. I mean, it will be featureless, and so uh, it doesn't work. It's, it's, and in fact, I mean, it will be no secret that the plots we showed in the paper required quite a bit of, of work. I mean, to, to have nice plots, if you're at band bottom, it always works. But if you want to, you know, it's, it's, this positivity condition is really a major, a major pain if you want to be, and typically we want to be near band center. I mean, all the good stuff in semiconductor, I mean, much of the good stuff in semiconductor physics is near band center. And, and a useful landscape function near band center, just lifting up the band, so band center becomes band bottom is not going to help. It will not give you a useful, but it will not give you a useful landscape function. It will give you an inequality which holds, but it will be featureless. Yeah, no, I, I, that actually wasn't quite my question, although you, that was a question I was interested in the answer to. But uh, my my question was um, if you if you um, just if you're interested in the edge the the bottom mm -hmm. so you're still interested in the bottom but you'd like to make things as efficient as possible so you wouldn't you would like to to not to overdo it that is not to get into this featureless range so you want to leave the 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 the, the thing as low as possible if you like uh, what I was asking was you you had this sufficient condition which was that the diagonal yeah. entries would dominate, but that seems not to be necessary. So what I was asking is, as a practical matter, oh, sure. whether you can do and, much and, better. Yeah. Yes, you could, but not in a systematic way. And mm -hmm. so if the, let's say, if, I mean, this is how we make the plots, of course, right? These are all plots which are quick. So we, we tune the parameters until it looks nice. Mm -hmm. If this would be a really expensive calculation, then probably you would go for the sufficient criterion. And, and but since these are typically you know, quick things, we just adjust it so that it looks nice and we have as much contrast between landscape and... and, and. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But there's lots of room before you get to that sufficient condition. Yes. 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 Okay. Okay. Uh, Very good. Are there any more questions? If not, uh, I have propose that we thank the both speaker again for very, two very instructive talk. You know, it's a, it was really amazing. And, and let me say one hello to Claude. Claude, we have shared papers from the 1980s. I'm sure you know that. Unmute, Claude, unmute. <laughs> Claude, you know. Claude Beisbusch and I go back when I worked at Philips, 1980s. Claude, you, Claude you, you have to unmute. Too. I remember we shared a uh, summer school, yeah. Yes, yes, absolutely. And we were in a grant together. We go back, man, this just shows how old we are. At least how old I am. Oh, yes. I remember that, uh, that European project. Oh, yes. That yes. was great. Yeah. yeah. Okay, friends. Okay, okay so... Uh, before thanks. we call off... Uh, sorry. Yeah, go, go ahead, go ahead. Say what you have to say, but don't disappear right away. 